my command of the English language is, if I may say so, pretty darn good. Um, and I can usually hold my own, even with a Oxford highbrow type, at least in terms of the use of the English language. Um, currently talking about Charon, in particular, his uh, uh, short history of decay. I get the impression that Charon, while perhaps not being a linguist, although I, he speaks several languages, I believe, seems to grasp the underlying subtleties and contradictions of language. Um, <clears throat> as we've discovered, and we're attempting to find out what he means, just the basic ideas of what he is putting forth and what the impetus behind it is. Yesterday I made a video concerning <clears throat> um, whether or not he was explaining his point of view or advising other people to accept his point of view, selling it, as opposed to just, this is what I believe, make of it what you will, or is he saying, this is a truth that applies to everybody, or, you know, it would do you good if you adopt this truth. <clears throat> um, I think that he's not proselytizing, to be perfectly honest. I think that the way that I'm reading it, and with a little bit of <laughs> help from Mystic of the Sands, I'm getting the impression that he's simply saying, this is the way I see things. Make of it what you will. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a reason for that. Um, um, or at least there's a reason for the way that he writes, um, talking about language, aphoristically, not quite as aphoristically as Nietzsche, but I would say that he probably writes aphoristically for the same reason. Um, <clears throat> in that what he's trying to say is so subtle that, you know, you use regular language and you despair of ever being understood correctly. Um, Choran's view is extremely nuanced, um, I think, in my opinion, as nuanced as Nietzsche is, and they both write kind of the same way. Nietzsche is a bit more obscure in the way he writes and a bit more bombastic, I suppose. Nietzsche is definitely trying to convert you. Um, <clears throat> but the writing style is the same, and I think that it's one of those interesting situations where you've, you're trying to explain a position, and when you come at it directly, it slips your grasp every single time. Every time you try to say, this is what I mean, you realize that what you're saying could be badly uh, misread um, based upon the stuff that's already in the minds of your readers. And as Piero 314 um, pointed out in his video on uh, language and how it ossifies and how the assumptions get built into everything, the ideas themselves can get obscured in the intricacies of the language and in the way that a person is actually using the language. Um, Nietzsche and Charan, Nietzsche was a philologist, and what got him into this stuff in the first place was his exegesis of the ancient Greek classics, trying to figure out what exactly they did mean. You think that it's very easy to say this is what Homer meant, or this is what the Greeks thought of anger, or this is what the Greeks believed to be the ideal political situation, but really, the, <laughs> you, you, they were a full-blown civilization with a past that was, or a past or a present, or whatever that was just as all-encompassing as ours. And you can't just simplify it all to put it into a high school textbook without distorting it. So he was trying to sort of say, what did the Greeks and Romans actually think of this issue, and how do I put this across to a modern audience? thinks completely differently than these people think, without distorting it. Well, you um, speak in parabolas, you speak parabolically, you speak in um, an elliptical sort of way, you use language to express that which language may not be able to express effectively. You have to sort of go into the intuitive part of language. Uh, to get your point across, because um, after a certain point you can be so easily misunderstood. As I say, the big misunderstanding here is, or the big disagreement here is, whether or not Chiron was just explaining himself or trying to get everybody else or other people to join his bandwagon. That takes a lot more work than simply reading what he has to say. You have to know something about the man. You have to know something about how he developed. You have to know something about 
what his views on, were on other things to cross-reference them um, and, and read that into what he has to say or what he would have assumed that his audience already thought of certain things. <clears throat> um, it, there's a temptation in philosophy especially to sort of get overly clinical and say that we can just nail things down easily with ideas like identity and non-contradiction, simplify things and make sense out of it all. And in my opinion, when you do that, you get things like morbid antinatalism and ephilism. Um, because you've stripped everything of all of its meaning, you've got a series of ruthlessly applied formulae, and you're left with a worldview that is completely empty of any meaning at all. It's just a, uh, a useless pack of science uh, that isn't doing or going anywhere, but it's left to the the actual meaning behind everything behind it almost deliberately deliberately stripped itself of meaning um, <clears throat> now okay I can understand that I can see that you know the way some people's minds work that's just how they're going to approach anything you don't want contradictions or paradoxes or nuance in there or anything you just want to be able to nail things down and arrive at some sort of conclusion based on that language doesn't work that way <laughs> We want it to work that way, but it doesn't. <clears throat> now, I'm dealing with Charan. Let me just, he's got uh, in uh, A Short History of Decay, he's got uh, chapter four or book four or whatever you want to call it, um, where uh, it's um, called Sanctity and the Grimaces of the Absolute. The Absolute. Um, the heck does that mean? So this is where I find Romanians sort of write the same way the French write. The French write, like to put paradoxes and bizarre juxtapositions in the same sentence to sort of screw you up a bit as you're reading it. A lot of people find this annoying, by the way, <laughs> in the way the French write. Choran writes that way. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm just going to read the, the head, headers of uh, the various subsections to Chapter 4 in his book, and you'll see uh, just how elliptical this is. Sanctity and the Grimaces of the Absolute. The refusal to procreate. Okay, that's straightforward. The aesthete hagiographer. Hmm, that's an interesting one. <laughs> I wonder what he means by that. Um, the disciple of certain saints. Wisdom and sanctity. Woman and the absolute. Spain. Hysteria of eternity. Stages of pride. Heaven and hygiene. On certain solitudes. Oscillation threat of sanctity. That's my favorite one. <laughs> Oscillation threat of sanctity. What the hell is he talking about? Well, good. It's good that you have that head scratcher because, you know, you go, what on earth does he mean? So you're going to sit down now and you're going to pick through every little word in that segment, in that section, to sort of get at what on earth he's talking about. Oscillation threat of sanctity. That's the whole point of aphoristic writing. <laughs> um, continue. The Tilting Cross. All right, fairly straightforward. Theology, yeah. Uh, the Metaphysical Animal. That's an interesting one. How many animals are metaphysical in their thinking? Genesis of Melancholy. Okay. Uh, finally, Divigations in a Monastery Exercise of Insubmission. Uh... Better go through that one also with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> um, if you've ever read Tristan Sara, who is a, a, a um, contemporary of Choran, uh, I think Sara was earlier, but not that much, maybe 20 years or whatever. You, you get used to reading like this, where your mind is being wrenched in every direction, and you're trying to, you're trying to make sense out of it, and it, it's just so bizarre. <clears throat> simply because the truths, or the I shouldn't say the truths, but the concepts that are being put forth are very difficult to get across without them being misunderstood because one little slip up and you might have screwed up the entire thing. Um, when uh, they took the hatchet to Nietzsche and said that he was actually apologizing for the Nazis, you see just how important these little nuances are because you just tinker with it a bit and you change the entire meaning of everything. Um... You know, it's Nietzsche himself recognized this. I think he told somebody or other, maybe his sister, who actually did do this. Um, he says, "When I think about what 
this philosophy will do in the wrong hands, I shudder. <laughs> if he only knew, eh? Um, I can see Joran being read the same way. Um, <laughs> Joran seems to be saying, this is how I see the world. Some people might see it and go, Joran is God. He's right. He's absolutely right. He's told me everything that I've always wanted to hear somebody say in, in perfect form, and um, time to go kill myself. <laughs> Or something like this, or shut myself up in an th attic apartment in a large city and live atomistically forever, whatever. Um, taking good care to have a girlfriend with me the whole time, of course, I'm a man, after all. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that's elliptical writing for you, isn't it? That's parabola, that's parables. Um, you can't really come at things uh, like this and tell the whole story you can never really have a book long enough to get your point across. If you ever attempted to wade through Being a Nothingness by uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, I've attempted that a few times. It's, oh my God. You know, you sort of think, I wish Sartre had sort of tried to write a bit more like Nietzsche, then I might have been able to figure out what he's talking about. As it is, I know Sartre um, basically through university lectures, because I can't for the life of me get through Being a Nothingness. Uh, it's, and, and I have a good command of the language, but it just, well... English when it's well translated, but it just gets so weird and so dry, dry, dry that the mind sort of rebels against it because, you know, he's he's being very clinical and very um, technical about something that is very esoteric, I suppose, maybe esoteric, I don't know, but very intuitive, and the intuitive part gets ignored in his attempts to describe it, something like the the critique that I said of of the scientific view of life where we've discovered everything and it's pointless and you know that kind of thing so yeah um, aphoristic writing I like it and I also like it because the way that it's written it's poetic and another thing that I do this is just how I assimilate information is I like to read these things I like to read little saints I'm just gonna randomly take a, a paragraph out of that um, Chapter 4 of uh, Short History of Decay. Man engenders only by remaining faithful to the general fate. Once he approaches the essence of the devil or of, or of the angel, he becomes sterile or begets abortions. Now just take that, those two sentences. I can play with those sentences inside my own head for hours um, because of the way that it's written. It's written poetically. It's written as a parable, elliptically. You can, uh, polemically even, you can you can just sort of play it over and over again in your head and try and read it a hundred thousand different ways and try and, you know, just impute meaning into it. Straw man him on purpose knowing that you're straw manning him to see if you can actually get his words to actually say something strange. That's the only way, I think, to conduct a proper exegesis. If, of course, you're interested in finding out what he actually meant. <clears throat> I tend to approach philosophy as though all the words that I see written down there are a trigger for something that's waiting to take place in my own mind, some sort of synthesis, if I dare use Hegelian language. <laughs> I don't, I'm not that academically interested in what the person was attempting to say. For example, if you look in my philosophy, I'm attempting to sort of, or I'm seeing the similarities between Tantra and Nietzsche. I find that they're actually, in a certain reading of both, very compatible, because both are profoundly life-affirming, but they're also saying, you got to make your own life worth living. Nobody will ever hand it to you. Um, <clears throat> that's, um, that's something that appeals to me. And yet the tools that I use are often borrowed from life-denying philosophies par excellence, like Jainism. Um, and, you you know, how, how on earth can you put that together? Well, that's not what I see these philosophers as. Some people have called me a Nietzschean, but I guess I, I, I wouldn't get too worked up about the, the title there. But what I was saying, what I would say is I, I've been heavily influenced by a lot of this thought that Nietzsche has brought out, but I've used it to sort of help ideas germinate in my own mind. <clears throat> I don't want to read Charan or Nietzsche or anybody um, as though I'm reading in the role of a disciple of these people. No, I don't see myself that way at all. Um, I don't have any pictures of philosophers on my walls or anything like that. I've got a framed 
etching of Nietzsche that I'm just sitting in my shed out back that I've never bothered to put on the wall. So, um, you know, it's not as though I idolize any of these people. Um, <clears throat> so, there's reasons why we have to approach language in a certain way, and there's reasons why we have to use language in a certain way, and there are limitations on language, and if we don't pay attention to these limitations, they can lead us into the cul-de-sac that uh, Pyro says you end up in if you stop revisiting the props of your own argument, your own philosophy, your own point of view. If you stop revisiting your axioms, and if you stop revisiting the terminology that you're using to discuss it. Words are pointing to things. They are the map, they're not the terrain. Once they become the terrain, the words have become the master and not the tool. 